But I'm going to limit my talks today to just a few topics uh, that I feel are, are crucial. And these include the nature, or the, I'm sorry, the use of illusion and deception in the UFO and abduction scenarios. And also the nature of some of the physical procedures which abductees report experiencing during these encounters. Since, since 1992, when my family's personal account was published in Into the Fringe, I've been engaged in two fairly lengthy investigations. And the results of this work, we recently published um, in the books Taken, Inside the Alien Human Abduction Agenda, and Masquerade of Angels. And although Taken was published first, um, I'd actually been working with Ted Rice and Barbara Bartholick on the research that led to Masquerade quite a while before the work in Taken. So I'm going to refer to Masquerade's material first this morning. And then I'm going to look briefly at the reports of the eight women who contributed their accounts to the material in Taken. And as I do so, I just want to point out again several important correlations to some of the things in, in the material from the women in Taken that had already turned up in the work that Barbara and I were doing with Ted Rice. So both of these discussions will be brief, and I will take the final half hour or so of my allotted time for a, a video presentation of some of the many drawings and photos and a video excerpt that I, uh, from women involved in the Taken project that I was unable to include in the book. That's one of the things I really uh, wish we could have done was to include a number of these illustrations. So I'm going to do that today to try to make up for what we were not able to do in the book. <clears throat> in 1991, when I first met Ted Rice, I was naturally intrigued by his memory of a mass abduction experience in Shreveport, Louisiana. <coughs> But I had no idea that looking into his report would lead me into areas that I'd never had to deal with before in this field. Uh, accounts of angels and apparitions, of bargains made with ghostly guardians, of spiritualist philosophy and psychic work assisted by spirit guides. I mean, all of this was part of Ted's extraordinary experiences, but it was not anything in my field of expertise, believe me. But in listening to Ted's accounts, I began to see evidence that was more familiar to me, thank God, uh, evidence that was very consistent with UFO sightings and abduction reports that I'd already come to know about. And since Ted had recalled an abduction involving a number of people, I wanted to see, first off, if there were any confirming <coughs> evidence that we could locate. And as we proceeded, Barbara and I, with interviews of many of the people from Ted's past, as well as his more recent experiences in the, in the present, we did find that such evidence actually was available and sur surfacing in consciously recalled events attested to by a number of witnesses. In fact, uh, four of Ted's neighbors <clears throat> described unusual events also consciously remembered from the night of the mass abduction that Ted had remembered in 1989. <coughs> Now, two of these witnesses were so disturbed by their memories of these events that the fear level was so high they wouldn't even let us include their accounts in the book. They shared them with us privately. So I would point out one thing for those of you who are not involved in direct investigation and working with abductees, that contrary to all the debunkers' claims that abductees and UFO witnesses tell their story for some personal gain, it's actually very difficult for those involved to risk coming forward with their accounts. And I would say for 99% of those who do make their experiences public, the resulting liabilities often outweigh the assets that they may gain from doing so. After thoroughly interviewing Ted about his conscious memories, um, we both felt that there were important gaps in several of these events that were worth investigating with hypnotic regression. And I'm not going to take time here today to argue the merits and the problems of regression work, but I will say that in my experience it's proven to be a very useful and manageable tool of research and that without it I think we would be left to deal only with alien controlled information which abductees are sent home with after their experiences. Now it's important to note uh, that at the time Ted began his work with Barbara and with me, he had been involved for most of his adult life in spiritualist work. 
uh, an extraordinary series of encounters that he had in Sun Valley, Idaho, with a mysterious woman, beautiful and young, who called herself Maya, first introduced Ted to metaphysical matters and also made him aware of his own psychic abilities. I would remind you that Maya is the Hindu term for illusion, by the way, and that Maya also turns up in a number of other people's experiences, often in the guise of some Pleiadian star being. Ted, at the time of meeting his Maya, had no thoughts on these lines, no information about such things, and certainly took her simply to be the very mysterious, beautiful woman that he experienced. In the account in, in Masquerade of Angels, however, you will find that there was more mystery to Maya's presence there in Sin Valley than Ted had any idea of at the time he was in, engaged with her. Still, coming face to face with his own abilities through some of these encounters and time spent with Maya, Ted was very reluctant to pursue these ideas or this, this ability he apparently had. And it was several years later before circumstances propelled him into psychic training and his involvement with the spiritualist church. And when he did make the commitment to go forward this, with this work, Ted went forward full tilt. In fact, he was a co-founder of the church's first congregation in Georgia. And he began doing psychic readings, which he is still doing today. Ted was convinced that the metaphysical understanding he had found was of God and that his work served God's higher purposes as revealed to Ted by his spirit guides from the other side. <laughs> but intermixed with Ted's paranormal events and psychic work were some startling encounters, encounters with apparently non-human entities, including, in 1989, of course, the abduction along with some of his neighbors. And at that point, Ted discovered that perhaps a different force had been intruding into his life for a number of years. And this was a force that his spirit guides had never bothered to mention, explain, and that his spiritualist training did not delve into either. So Ted needed some new information, and uh, this led to our contact and investigation. And as it progressed, it became clear that the research into all of these extraordinary experiences could take several years. But after the first two years, we felt that the information we had gathered was important enough to communicate it as soon as possible, albeit going on with the research. And we're continuing to do that to this, this point right now. We stopped and did the material uh, organization that resulted in Masquerade, which was published in 1994. And we have full intentions of following up this report with everything else that Barbara and Ted and I have continued to uncover and are continuing to pursue at this point, as soon as it's feasible to get this material back out to you as, as a sequel, a follow-up, an ongoing investigation. <coughs> A full account of our first two years of work is found in Masquerade of Angels, but for brevity's sake today, I'm going to focus on only three aspects of the uh, alien ag agenda as it relates to the material that Ted and Barbara and I have, have had to deal with. The first matter is the intrinsic deception at the heart of this agenda, and that's something that's become clearer with every new report that surfaces. Whether we choose to call it screen memory, telepathic mind control, technological mind control, or virtual reality scenarios, the entities involved in the abduction phenomenon employ masterful illusory capabilities. And I don't think the importance of this fact can be stressed strongly enough. It must affect all of our thinking and our research when it comes to these alien human contacts. In Ted's experiences, for example, there were several occasions where such masquerading techniques were employed, and I could spend, as I said, the rest of the morning just dealing with these, and I'm going to be making very brief references, and hope you maybe want to read about the rest of it in the book. One instance involved the appearance of Ted's deceased grandfather on board a craft into which he and his grandmother had been taken when Ted was a young boy. Um, I think I spoke about this a couple of years ago when I was uh, first working on Ted's material and I didn't identify that this was Ted's story I was referring to, 
The scenario involved persuading his grandmother uh, to engage in a sexual activity with a non-human entity, and when she refused to do so, saying she had only ever made love with her husband and he was dead, the aliens produced the dead husband. In another instance, uh, Ted watched a scenario that surely was not occurring in normal reality terms. Uh, I call it a virtual reality scenario. And this began shortly after he had heard a very quiet sound like helicopter blades. <coughs> and in this ongoing event after the helicopter blade noise, uh, Ted watched as a, a human looking entity dressed in military clothes uh, popped through the ceiling into the room, holding a young child that was very, very similar to Ted's appearance at the same age. And Ted was told that uh, they were going to return that which had been taken from him. And an account of what followed from that, again, is, is in the book. And uh, I won't take time to recite everything there to you. But the virtual reality event, there were certainly no human paratrooper popping through the ceiling carrying a young child in reality terms. But the illusion was quite as real as you and I here today. But perhaps the most illuminating of such events that uh, we in, were able to investigate involved Ted and another woman, a woman, who witnessed a third person, another woman, undergoing her own virtual reality episode, again marked at the onset by the sound of a helicopter. Now, some of you may be quick, as they say in the OJ trial, to rush to get judgment on this and conclude that these events were generated by some terrestrial, governmental, or military covert mind control operation. After all, we've got helicopter blades out there. But it should be noted that only the targeted person in these events heard the helicopters, while others in the same house or same room did not. I don't think our terrestrial helicopters are that selective in the noise they generate. I, believed, uh, I believe now that the reported and confirmed details in all of these reports are strong evidence against accepting consciously recalled alien encounter reports at face value because of the illusion capabilities, because of the screens, and because of the virtual reality technology that we have witnessed being manifest by these entities. I believe that if we build our theories on, the, on such information, the consciously reported information only, we're building on sand, on illusions that the aliens create for us, and I think to confuse and mislead us. Now this is not to say, however, that all alien encounters are virtual reality events, because there is also plenty of very strong evidence for the physical nature of many of these encounters. So to be perfectly objective, the definition of abduction would have to include any event or scenario that is generated externally for the targeted person, whether it be a physical encounter, a virtual reality scenario, or a telepathic con contact. Now, a second important discovery from Ted's investigation, and this was important at least for me, was the possibility of cloned human bodies produced by these abductors. And that's the second thing I'd like to, to talk about briefly today. In the mid-1970s, um, a memory of a childhood event surfaced in Ted's mind during the night while he was sleeping. And in an altered state of consciousness, he got out of bed and went to his typewriter in the middle of the night and wrote out this memory as a story. In 1991 and 92, when Ted and Barbara began a series of regressions, it occurred, it popped up in these events, this scenario that Ted had recalled as a story, but a very different version of that basic story emerged. Uh, a version in which he went through what can only be called a horrific experience, in which his original body he perceived as being killed and taken away, and his essence, for lack of a better word, we could call it soul energy or whatever term one would like to use, was contained temporarily in a black box placed on a counter and uh, transferred shortly thereafter into a cloned copy of young Ted's body. 
this was his perception of what occurred with him, and this is the first time I had ever heard of such things really in any detail. <laughs> now, when we made our in external investigation, interviewing people who were part of Ted's family and friends at the times many of these things occurred, several pieces of corroborating items did come out, mm -hmm. all of which I tried to prevent, present fully in the book, but just briefly, one of the most telling, for me at least, was interviewing uh, Ted's mother. And at the time that Ted recalled being transferred into a different body, his mother recalled the suffering he went through for weeks afterwards, feeling that his body was on fire, having to soak him repeatedly in ice water trying to bring him some comfort, and noting that the childhood diseases that Ted had had before the cloning recurred afterwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. The third point that I want to correlate uh, with information from subsequent investigations in the accounts in Taken concerns the possible involvement of human, apparently military, personnel with certain abductees. Now, if nothing else, this involvement of some authoritative agency within our government should tell us that our decision-making powers that be, the structure that pretty much controls how we deal with this phenomenon as well as with everything else going on in our society, takes this phenomenon very seriously. I would guess that most of you here have already learned about the many hard pieces of evidence that do reveal the government's knowledge uh, of and involvement with the UFO question. Um, such classic presentations as um, those in clear intent and above top secret can point you in the direction of getting your hands on the paperwork generated by the government. That, that makes it very clear they have involvement they have never been willing to discuss with the public.